Uh, I'm going to focus on the economic crisis. Uh, let me um, turn to slide two. Okay, so let me talk very briefly about the response to the short-term distress. Um, to belabor the obvious, there's a very high cost relative to previous e epidemics because there's a lockdown. And with emerging economies on top of that, you will have a drop in commodity prices uh, in tourism, you will have foreign exchange denominated debt. And the second obvious thing is that there is very little more hazard involved in it because um, if people cannot work, if firms cannot operate, it's not their fault. Uh, so you have to protect the workers, the unemployed, the self-employed. You have to protect the, product, the productive structure. We have had job risk retention schemes, uh, protecting the SMEs, protecting uh, the firms in the most affected industries and the banks. Slide. Now, at the same time, we have to limit the damage. Um, so we have to support. There is no point stimulating the economy yet because there's not going to be more production anyway. Um, and we have to limit the debt. I'm going to come back to that. So there should be no open bar. Uh, so for example, I'm not in favor of uniform, universal check for everyone or broad-based subsidies to business. Um, I would favor things more like means and job testing support. And the second thing, which is kind of obvious is that we must facilitate return to work uh, in a way which is consistent with public health. When teleworking is not feasible, you need double testing. Slide. Slide. Um, medium term management. Um, there are two related questions on medium term management. The first is on debt sustainability. Um, there is there will be a high increase in, in public debt, and that's completely unavoidable, that has to happen. But that's a concern for emerging countries, but not only for emerging countries, also for Southern Europe, which is already pretty indebted and doesn't grow very fast. As you all know, it's easier to sustain debt when the rate of growth is higher than the rate of interest. Now, in the short run, the rate of growth is going to be relatively small. There won't be much investment and a lot of, lot of trust, but at the same time, I will bet the rate of interest, the real rate of interest will remain low uh, because of precautionary savings, because of low investment. So when I look at that, I will think that an increase in public debt may be sustainable because the interest rate won't be higher than the rate of growth, but that requires, of course, the absence of speculative attack. So you need trust in, in, in the public debt. The second related issue is who will pay the bill for a crisis? And here I see five scenarios. The first scenario is we reduce our consumption and we basically repair the debt slowly by generating primary surpluses, meaning budget surpluses before paying interest on debt. Slide, please. The second hypothesis is restructuring or debt reputation. And I think it's a very risky strategy um, because the state will lose, people will lose trust in the state. So the state will have to balance its budget immediately because it could not borrow. At the same time, as you will have to restart the economy, honor the guarantees, pay current expenditures, and so on. So that sounds very risky to me. Um, the third hypothesis is exceptional wealth tax and income tax on individuals, of course, and some of that will happen on the rich for sure, but if you want to uh, raise substantial amounts, you have to also tax the middle class and taxing on banks. So that's called financial repression, or that's one of the aspects of financial repression. And there are many ways of doing that. For example, you force banks to buy sovereign bonds at a high price that doesn't reflect the subsequent inflation. Um, I think that would be very difficult to do in the Eurozone because um, the banks are already fragile. Then you will have some kind of agreement needed among countries on how to share the repression. And then 
it will be a lot of risk-taking because already now, you know that you don't have to put, the banks don't have to put any equity in front of the loss they might incur if the sovereign debt they own default. Uh, on top of that, many of those debts are debts in the own country. That's called the doom loop. Those are very risky situations. Next slide, please. Fourth hypothesis is debt monetization. So basically the central buy, bank buys back debt. Um, in theory, that's inflationary because there's more liquidity, more money around chasing the same goods. And therefore there should be inflation. Now in 2008, after 2008, the big surprise is that despite massive injections of liquidity by central banks, there was no, so, no, no inflation. That's in part because of the precautionary savings, because the bank started holding more, there were deflationary expectations, and so on and so forth. Now, it's an interesting option. We have to keep in mind that uh, um, the poor have many of their assets in nominal savings, so if there is inflation, they will suffer a lot. And the elephant in the room, of course, in the Eurozone is budgetary discipline. When, when I say budgetary discipline, by the way, I've moved the cursor quite a, quite a bit. It's not the budgetary discipline of five months ago. It's budgetary discipline given that we have to spend a huge amount of money now. So there will be big budget deficit and that's quite normal. And finally, the fifth hypothesis, and that's specific to the Eurozone and that's being discussed today, is introduction of euro bonds or corona bonds. So basically making the countries jointly liable for the debt of each other. So it basically goes beyond the existing tools of solidarity. There's a lot of solidarity now happening through the ECB, a little bit through the European stability mechanism, not much because it's subject to conditions. And it consists in pooling of debt, which would be beneficial for Southern Europe. Um, but of course, Northern Europe is not going to like that. And it's unlikely to happen on a large scale, at least until recently. I would still bet if it happens, it will happen on a small scale. It's much easier to use ECB support. Uh, it can be set up very quickly. Um, it's much less transparent to public opinion and that's more likely to happen. Next slide. Now, the million question, million, million, million dollar question, I'm sorry. Um, is it going to be business as usual or is it going to be a wake up call? And that's a little bit what Darren was talking about as well. So there are several dimensions to that. The first dimension is we as citizens, are we going to change our behavior? Um, it is known from social sciences that after external wars, civil wars are different of course, but after external wars, uh, people to, turn, to, to join social groups that tend to experience uh, uh, more empathy. Of course, most of it is parochial, it's toward the in-group. Uh, but here the in-group is very big because the out-group is the virus. Unless people start fighting with each other, calling that a Chinese disease or this mentality every country for itself prevails. But there is an issue of collective awareness we have to, to uh, basically show, up, show more solidarity. Now, Next slide, please. Next question is, will policymaking take a longer term perspective? As you all know, our policies, especially those with, with remote consequences, tend to demonstrate myopia. And that has gotten even worse with populism because populism insists quite a lot on the short term. Uh, the most obvious example is climate change, but you can extend that to education, to inequality and many other things. And now we know it extends also to, to healthcare. Um, even so, a pandemic like this is not no longer a rare event. We hope it's going to remain a rare, rare event. But if you think about the melting of the permafrost, liberating ancient viruses and bacteria, antiviral resistance, back, biological warfare, and so on, you know, this is a very big threat. We have to prepare for it. And more generally, the theme is, are we going to evolve toward less consumption and more investment? And that would be desirable, um, and it's not very easy to achieve. So a couple of things we could think about is, 
first a norm-based intervention, so trying to convince people that some behaviors are antisocial and are frowned upon by the population. Um, we have tried that for climate change, it didn't work very well. Uh, but when it's combined with incentives, it can be sometimes very efficient. Um, we can try to change national accounting. It's, a, it's an old story about trying to um, put more emphasis on investment and penalize investment less. Of course, it has to be non-manipulable because if you start not counting investment into much deficits and governments tend to classify everything as an investment, even consumption is classified as an investment. Finally, I think we should set up more independent observatories. They have to be very independent, but basically try to assess the long-term public performance of, of governments in matter of healthcare, but in other matters as well. Just look at the PISA ranking and or Shanghai ranking, which are not that great, but still uh, the citizen in countries that have the educational system actually is not the best in the world. Actually, sometimes it's the worst in the world. So, uh, it's very important for democracy to have more information. Next slide, please. And let me conclude with a few notes on globalization. So um, there's been a lot of criticism of globalization uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. It predates COVID-19, of course, with uh, uh, the inward-looking populist attitude, my country first. Um, there's a lot of call, the most reasonable people will call for reshoring. And some of that has to happen, of course, but let's be careful with that. Um, I think there's a big tension between the, the repeated demand of population for more purchasing power and the yellow jackets in France, for example, and the double whammy, which is going to happen because we are going to have a loss of purchasing power coming from the crisis. And on top of that, you will be adding a loss of purchasing power coming from the closure of borders. And as usual, the choice is not between globalization and no globalization. The real question is how to get rid of the perverse effect of globalization. It's an old debate. We have seen uh, that we are not that good at compensating workers um, who have lost their job due to imports or technological change. Um, especially in the US, but even in Europe, we're not that good at doing that. We're not that good at anticipating transition to protect those workers. But now we have learned that we're not that good at predicting disruption in the supply chains. And I will insist, and I'm going to do that to, in a distinction between uh, those for essential supplies like national security, the response to health crisis or basic foods. Next slide. And that will be my final slide. This distinct, distinction between supply, which are essential in crisis time and the others. So for supplies which are essential in crisis time, the market just doesn't work because the market in order, in order to procure those, which are going to be sold very rarely uh, with very low probability, um, as to charge extremely high prices, which for various reasons are not desirable. On top of that, for some of those, you have externalities as well. So the market just doesn't work. It has to be the state doing it. And if you want to learn how, how to do it, just look at electricity markets. So electricity markets are markets, generators compete to supply electricity. However, for those plants, which are used only a couple of hours, a couple of days per year, they will have to ask huge prices in order to remain in operation and the state intervenes. I will distinguish that from ordinary, ordinary consumption of, of, of goods where there will be a, a very big consideration of the supply chain. And Darren will talk about that. It's very important, but it's more prerog prerogative of firms. They will lose market share if they lose their customers. And here I want to emphasize a distinction because we have to resist lobbies. If you start saying, oh, we are going to protect or favor national firm in public procurement, then every, every industry is going to apply for a special treatment on the ground that it's essential. So we have to restrict that to the supplies which are essential, but those have to be supplied by the state. And then we have to be flexible and clever 
reshoring is not resilience. And actually the disruption in France was due to China in January, February, and then was due maybe due to Europe in, uh, in April. And of course, we also have to follow the technological evolution. So for example, uh, it may be the case that we can use 3D, 3D printers in order to manufacture ventilators. They are slow, but they actually can be used for that. And many other things that might be very important so we can produce locally. Let me stop here and thank you very much for your attention.